the stage this apparent connection which intervene between the first beginnings of quote universal unquote evolution and our present state. <laughs> to give such an account would be impossible as it would be incomprehensible to men to count even rough the nature of the plane of existence next to that to which for the moment the consciousness is limited. The stanzas, therefore, give an abstract formula which can be applied mutatis mutandis to all evolution, to that of our tiny earth, to that of the chain of planets, to which that earth forms one, to the solar universe, to which that chain belongs, and so on, in an ascending scale, till the mind reels and is exhausted in the effort. The seven stanzas given in this volume represent the seven terms of this abstract formula. They refer to and describe the seven great stages of the evolutionary process, which are spoken of in the Puranas as the seven creations, and in the Bible as the days of creation. The first answer describes the state of the one all during Pradaya, before the first structure of reawakening manifestation. A moment's thought shows that such a state can only be symbolized. To describe it is impossible. Nor can it be symbolized except in negatives. For since it is the state of absoluteness per se, can possess none of those specific attributes which serves to describe objects in positive terms. Hence that state can only be suggested by the negatives of all the most abstract attributes which men feel rather than conceive as the remotest limits attainable by their power of conception. The stage described in stanza two is, to a Western mind, so nearly identical with that mentioned in the first stanza that to express the idea of its difference would require a treatise in itself. Hence, it must be left to the intuition and the higher faculties of the reader to grasp, as far as he can, the meaning of the allegorical phrase is used. Indeed, it must be remembered that all these stances appeal to the inner faculties rather than to the ordinary comprehension of the physical brain. Stanza 3 describes the reawakening of the universe to life after pralaya. It depicts the emergence of the monads from their state of absorption within the One, the earliest and highest stage in the formation of worlds. The term monad being one which may apply equally to the vastest solar system or the tiniest atom. Stanza 4 shows the differentiation of the quote German quote of the universe into the septenary hierarchy of conscious divine powers who are the active manifestations of the one supreme energy. They are the framers, shapers and ultimately the creators of all the manifested universe in the only sense in which the name creator is intelligible. They inform and guide it. They are the intelligent beings who adjust and control evolution, embodying in themselves those manifestations of the one law, which we know as the laws of nature. Generically, they are known as the Diamkochans, though each of the various groups has its own designation in the secret doctrine. This stage of evolution is spoken of in Hindu mythology as the creation of the gods. In stanza 5, the process of world formation is described. First, diffused cosmic matter, then the fiery, quote, whirlwind, unquote, the first stage in the formation of a nebula. That nebula condenses, and after passing through various transformations, forms the solar universe, the planetary chain, or a single planet, as the case may be. The subsequent stages in the formation of a world are indicated in stanza 6, which brings the evolution of such a world down to its fourth great period, corresponding to the period in which we are now living. Stanza 7 continues the history, tracing the descent of life down to the appearance of man, and thus closes the first book of the secret doctrine. The development of man from his first appearance on this earth and this realm to the state in which we now find him, will form the subject of book two. Note, the stanzas which form the thesis of every section are given throughout in their modern translated version, 
as it would be worse than useless to make the subject still more difficult by introducing the archaic phraseology of the original with its puzzling style and words. Extracts are given from the Chinese, Tibetan, and Sanskrit translations of the original censor commentaries and glosses on the Book of Jia, these being now rendered for the first time into a European language. It is almost unnecessary to state that only portions of the seven stanzas are here given. Were they published complete, they would remain incomprehensible to all, save a few high occultists. Nor is there any need to assure the reader that no more than most of the profane does the writer, or rather the humble recorder, understand those forbidden passages. To facilitate the reading, and to avoid the too frequent reference to footnotes, it was thought best to blend together texts and glosses, using the Sanskrit and Tibetan proper names whenever those cannot be avoided in preference to giving the originals. The more so, as the said terms are all accepted synonyms, the former only being used between a master and his jealous disciples. First, were one to translate into English, using only the substantives and technical terms as employed in one of the Tibetan and Zansara versions, thus one would read as follows. Toak in Zugu slept seven kodulu, Sodmanas Ashiba, Old Nug Buzo, Koko Not, Chiankamu, La Kohan Not, Tenbrel Chugni Not, Dharmakaya Seas, Tgen Shang Not Bikam, Arang and Sha in Nukovon Yichi, Alone Thog Yisin, Inite of Sun Chan, and Yung Kru, Harishnipana, etc., etc which would sound like pure abracadabra. As this work's written for the instruction of students of occultism and not for the benefit of the philologists, we may well avoid such foreign terms whenever it is possible to do so. The untranslatable terms alone, incomprehensible unless explained in their meanings, are left, but all such terms are rendered in their Sanskrit forms. Needless to remind the reader that these are in almost every case, the later developments of the later language and pertain to the fifth root phrase. Sanskrit, as now known, was not spoken by the Atlanteans, and most of the philosophical terms used in the systems of the India of the post Mahabharatan period are not found in the Vedas, nor are they to be met with in the original stanzas, but only their equivalents. The reader, who is not a theosophist, is once more invited to regard all that which follows as a fairy tale, if he likes, at the best as one of the yet unproven speculations of dreamers, and at the worst as an additional hypothesis to the many scientific hypotheses past, present, and future, some exploded, some still lingering. It is not in any sense worse than are many of the so-called scientific theories, and it is in every case more philosophical and probable. In view of the abundant comments and uh, explanations required, the references to the footnotes are given in the usual way, while the sentences to be commented upon are marked with figures. Additional matter will be found in these chapters of symbolism form in part two, as well as in part three, these being often more full of information than the text. The secret doctrine now continues with the stanzas from the Book of Jam that form the heart of this book. But to make this audiobook more accessible to the general listener, it will be continued in compliance with Blavatsky's recommendations for its study, and therefore continue with the summing up, beginning on page 269 of the first volume of the facsimile edition. The secret doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. The audiobook now continues with summing up the first part of the first volume, which deals with the pitch and marrow of the secret doctrine. 
Hermes in Christian garb. Some occult aphorisms. And the seven powers of nature. Quote, the history of creation and of this world from its beginning up to the present time is composed of seven chapters. The seventh chapter is not yet written, unquote. From T. Savaro, Theosophist, 1881. However incomplete and feeble as an exposition, it is at any rate an approximation, using the word in a mathematical sense, to that which is the oldest basis for the subsequent postmodernists. Tarenda in a European tongue, the grand panorama of the ever periodically recurring law, impressed upon the plastic minds of the first races endowed with consciousness by those who reflected the same on the universal mind is daring, for no human language, save the Sanskrit, which is that of the gods, can do so with any degree of adequacy. This in this work must be forgiven for the sake of the motive. As a whole, neither the foregoing nor what follows can be found in full anywhere. It is not taught in any of the six Indian schools of philosophy, for it pertains to their synthesis, the seventh, which is the occult doctrine. It is not traced of any crumbling papyrus of Egypt, nor is it any longer graven on Assyrian tile or granite wall. The books of the Vedanta, the last word of human knowledge, give out but the metaphysical aspect of this world as well as and their priceless thesaurus, Upanishads, Upanishad being a compound word meaning the conquest of ignorance by the revelation of secret spiritual knowledge require now the additional possession of a master key to enable the students to get at their full meaning. The reason for this I learned to state here as I learned it from a master. The name of Panishads is usually translated esoteric doctrine. These treatises form part of the Shruti, or revealed knowledge, revelation in short, and are generally attached to the Brahmana portion of the Vedas as their third division. No. The Vedas have a distinct dual meaning, one expressed by the literal sense of the words, the other indicated by the meter and the shraddha, intonation, which are as the life of the Vedas. Learned pundits and philologists, of course, deny that shraddha has anything to do with philosophy or ancient esoteric doctrines, but the mysterious connection between shraddha and light is one of its most profound secrets quote from T. Sabaro's First Years of Theosophy, page 154. There are over 150 Upanishads enumerated by and known to Orientalists, who credit the oldest with being written probably about 600 years before Christ. But of genuine texts, there does not exist a fifth of the number. The Upanishads are to the Vedas what the Kabbalah is to the Jewish Bible. They treat of and expound the secret of mystic meaning of the Vedic texts. They speak of the origin of the universe, the nature of deity, and of spirit and soul, as also of the metaphysical connection of mind and matter. In a few words, they contain the beginning and the end of all human knowledge, but they have now ceased to reveal it since the day of Buddha. If it were otherwise, the Upanishads could not be called esoteric, since they are now openly attached to the sacred Brahmanic books, which have, in our present age, become accessible even to the Mlekas, outcasts, and the European Orientalists. One thing in them, and this is in all Upanishads, invariably and constantly points to their ancient origin, and proves a that they were written in some of their portions before the care system became the tyrannical institution which it still is, and b, that half of their contents had been eliminated, while some of them were rewritten and abridged. Quote, the great teachers of the higher knowledge and the Brahmans are continually represented as going to a kshatriya military caste. Kings become their pupils, unquote. As Cowell pertinently remarks, the Upanishads Read an entirely different spirit from other Brahmanical writers, a freedom of thought unknown in earlier work except in the Rig Veda themselves. 
The second fact is explained by tradition recorded in one of the manuscripts on Buddha's life. It says that the Upanishads were originally attached to their Brahmanas after the beginning of a reform, which led to the exclusiveness of the present caste system among the Brahmins a few centuries after the invasion of India by the quote, twice born, unquote. They were complete in those days and were used for the instruction of the Chenas who were preparing for their initiation. This lasted so long as the Vedas and the Brahmanas remained in the sole and exclusive keeping of the temple Brahmins, while no one else had the right to study or even read them outside of the sacred caste. Then came Gautama, the prince of Kapilavastu, after learning the whole of the Brahmanical wisdom in the Rashiya or the Upanishads, and finding that the teachings differed little, if at all, from those of the teachers of light inhabiting the snowy ranges of the Himalaya, the disciple of the Brahmins feeling indignant because the sacred wisdom was thus withheld from all but the Brahmins determined to save the whole world by popularizing it. Note, the teachers of life inhabiting the snow range of the Himalaya are also called the sons of wisdom and of the first mist and the brothers of the sun in the Chinese records. Sijang, Tibet is mentioned in the manuscripts of the sacred library of the province of Fukien as the great seat of occult learning from time immemorial, ages before Buddha. The Emperor Yu, the great, 2,207 years before Christ, a pious mystic and great adept, is said to have obtained his knowledge from the great teachers of the Snowy Range in Zidang. End of note. And it was that the Brahmins, seeing that their sacred knowledge and occult wisdom was falling into the hands of the Mecca, abridged the texts of the Upanishads originally containing thrice the matter of the Vedas and Brahmanas together, without altering, however, one word of the texts. They simply detached from the manuscripts the most important portions containing the last word of the mystery of being. The key to the Brahmanical secret code remained henceforth with the initiates alone, and the Brahmins were thus in a position to publicly deny the correctness of Buddha's teachings by appealing to the Upanishads, silence forever on the chief questions. Such is the esoteric tradition beyond the Himalayas. Shri Sri Sankarasharya, the greatest initiative living in the historical ages, wrote many Abhashya on the Upanishads. But his original treatises, as there are reasons to suppose, have not yet fallen into the hands of the Philistines. They are too jealously preserved in smuts, monasteries, matas. And there are still weightier reasons to believe that the priceless Bashaya's commentary on the esoteric doctrines of the Brahmins by their greatest expounder will remain for ages yet to dead letter to most of the Hindus, except the Smartana Brahmins. This sect, founded by Sankarasharya, which is still very powerful in southern India, is now almost the only one to produce students who have preserved sufficient knowledge to comprehend the dead letter of the Bashyas. The reason of this is that they alone, are am informed, have occasionally real initiates at their head in their matans as for instance in the Shringajiri in the western Gulf of Mysore. On the other hand, there is no sect in that desperately exclusive caste of the Brahmins, more exclusive than is the Shvartava, and the reticence of its followers to say what they may know the cult sciences and the esoteric doctrine is only equaled by their pride and learning. Therefore, the right of the present statement must be prepared beforehand and even the denial of such statements as are brought forward in this work. Not that any claim to infallibility or to perfect correctness in every detail of all that which is herein said was ever put forward. Facts are there, and they can hardly be denied, but owing to the intrinsic difficulties of the subjects treated and the almost insurmountable limitations of the English tongue, as of all other European languages, to express certain ideas, it is more than probable that the writer has failed to present the explanations in the best and in the clearest form. Yet all that could be done was done under every adverse circumstance, and this is the utmost 
that can be expected of any writer. Let us recapitulate and show by the vastness of the subjects expounded how difficult, if not impossible, it is to do them full justice. One, the secret doctrine is the accumulated wisdom of the ages, and its cosmogony alone is the most stupendous and elaborate system that is even in the exotericism of the Purangas. For such is the mysterious power of occult symbolism that the facts which have actually occupied countless generations of initiated seers and prophets to marshal, to sit down and explain, in the bewildering series of evolutionary progress, are all recorded on a few pages of geometrical signs and lists. The flashing gaze of those seers has penetrated into the very kernel of matter and recorded the soul of things there, where an ordinary profane, however learned, would have perceived but the external work of form. But modern science believe not in the soul of things, and hence will reject the whole system of ancient cosmogony. It is useless to say that the system in question is no fancy of one or several isolated individuals, that it is the uninterrupted record covering thousands of generations of seers whose respective experiences were made to test and to verify the traditions passed orally by one early race to another of the teachings of high and exalted beings who watch over the childhood of humanity. Ages, the wise men of the fifth race, of the stock saved and rescued from the last cataclysm and shifting of continents, had passed their lives in learning, not teaching. How did they do so? It is answered by checking, testing, and verifying in every department of nature the traditions of old by the independent visions of great adepts. That is, men who have developed and perfected their physical, mental, psychic, and spiritual organizations to the utmost possible degree. No vision of one adept was accepted till it was checked and confirmed by the visions, so obtained as to stand as independent evidence of other adepts and by centuries of experiences. Two, the fundamental law in that system is the central point from which all emerged, around and toward which all gravitates, and upon which is hung the philosophy of the rest. It is the one homogeneous divine substance principle, the one radical cause. Quote, some few whose lamp shone brighter have been led from cause to cause to nature's secret head and found that one first principle must be, unquote, substance principle, for it becomes, quote, substance, unquote, on the plane of the manifested universe, an illusion, while it remains a, quote, principle, unquote, in the beginningless and endless abstract, visible and invisible space. It is the omnipresent reality, impersonal, because it contains all and everything. Its impersonality is the fundamental conception of the system. It is latent in every atom in the universe, and is the universe itself. See in chapters on symbolism, primordial substance, and divine thought. Three, the universe is the periodical manifestation of this unknown absolute essence. To call it essence, however, is to sin against the very spirit of the philosophy. For though the noun may be derived in this case from the verb esse, to be, yet it cannot be identified with a being of any kind that can be perceived by human intellect. It is best described as neither spirit nor matter, but both. Parabrahman and Mulaprakriti are one in reality, yet two in the universal conception of the manifest, even in the conception of the one logos its first manifestation to which, as the able lecturer in the notes of the Bhagavad Gita shows, it appears from the objective standpoint of the one logos as Mulaprakriti and not as Parabrahma, as its veil and not the one reality hidden behind, which is unconditioned and absolute. For the universe is called, with everything in it, Maya, because all is temporary therein, from the ephemeral life of a firefly to that of the sun, compared to the eternal immutability of the one and the changelessness of that principle, 
the universe with its evanescent, ever-changing forms must be necessarily in the minds of a philosopher no better than a will of the West. Yet the universe is real enough to the conscious beings in it, which are as unreal as it is itself. Everything in the universe, throughout all its kingdoms, is conscious, that is, endowed with a consciousness of its own kind and on its own plane of perception. We men must remember that because we do not perceive any signs which we can recognize of consciousness, say, in stones, we have no right to say that no consciousness exists there. There is no such thing as either dead or blind matter as there is no blind or unconscious law. These find no place among the conceptions of occult philosophy. The latter never stops at surface appearances, and for it, the numeral senses have more reality than their objective counterparts. It resembles therein the medieval nominalists, for whom it was the universals that were the realities and the particulars which existed only in name and human fancy. 6. The universe is worked and guided from within outwards. As above, so it is below. As in heaven, so on earth. A man, a microcosm, a miniature copy of the macrocosm, is the living witness to this universal law and to the mode of its action. We see that every external motion, act, gesture, whether voluntary or mechanical, organic or mental, is produced and preceded by internal feeling or emotion, will or volition, and thought or mind. As no outward motion or change, where normal, in man's external body can take place unless provoked by an inward impulse, even through one of these functions named, so with external or manifested universe. The whole cosmos is guided, controlled, and animated by almost endless series of hierarchies of sentient beings each having a mission to perform, and who, whether we give to them one name or another, and call them the Ankochans, or angels, or messengers, in the sense only that they are the agents of karmic and cosmic laws. They vary infinitely in their respective degrees of consciousness and intelligence. And to call them all pure spirits without any of the earthly alloy, which time is wont to prey upon, is only to indulge in critical fancy. For each of these beings either was or prepares to become a man, if not in the present, then in a past or coming cycle, Mangan time. They are perfected, were not incipient men. They differ morally from the terrestrial human beings on their higher, less material spheres, only in that they are devoid of the feeling of personality and of the human emotional nature, two purely earthly characteristics. The former, or the perfected, have become free from those feelings because a. they have no longer fleshly bodies, an ever-numbing weight on the soul, and b. the pure spiritual element being left untrammeled and more free, they are less influenced by Maya than man can ever be unless he is an adept who keeps his two personalities, the spiritual and the physical, entirely separate. The incipient monads, having never had terrestrial bodies yet, can have no sense of personality or egoism. That which is meant by personality being a limitation and a relation, or, as defined by Coleridge, individuality existing in itself, but with a nature as a ground. The term cannot, of course, be applied to non-human entities, but, as a fact insisted upon by generations of seers, None of these beings, high or low, have either individuality or personality as separate entities. That is, they have no individuality in the sense in which a man says, I am myself and no one else. In other words, they are conscious of no such distinct separateness as men and things have on earth. Individuality is the characteristic of their respective hierarchies, not of their units. And these characteristics vary only with the degree of the plane to those hierarchies belong, the nearer to the region of homogeneity and the one divine, the purer and the less accentuated that individuality in the hierarchy. They are finite, 
in all respects, with the exception of their higher principle, the immortal sparks reflecting the universal divine flame, individualized and separated only by the spheres of illusion, by differentiation as elusive as the rest. They are living ones, because they are the streams projected on the cosmic screen of the illusion from the absolute life, being in whom life cannot become extinct before the fire of ignorance is extinct in those who sense these lives. Having sprung into being under the quickening influence of the uncreated being, the reflection of the great central sun that radiates on the shores of the river of life, it is the inner principle in them which belongs to the waters of immortality, while its differentiated clothing is as perishable as man's body. Therefore, Jung was right in saying that angels are men of the superior kind, and no more. They are neither ministering nor protecting angels, nor are they harbingers of the Most High still less the messengers of wrath of any god of such a man's fancy has created. To appeal to their protection is as foolish as to believe that their sympathy may be secured by any kind of propitiation, for they are, as much as man himself, the slaves and creatures of immutable karmic and cosmic law. The reason for it is evident. Having no elements of personality in their essence, they can have no personal qualities, such as attributed by men in their exoteric religions to their anthropomorphic god, a jealous and exclusive god who rejoices and feels grateful, is pleased with sacrifice, and is more despotic in his vanity than any finite foolish man. Man, as shown in Book 2, being a compound of these essences of all those celestial hierarchies may succeed in making himself, as such, superior in one sense to any hierarchy or class, or even combinations of them. Man can neither propitiate nor command the devas, it is said, but by paralyzing his lower personality and arriving thereby at the full knowledge of the non-separateness of his higher self from the one absolute self, man can, even during his terrestrial life, become as one of us. Thus it is, by eating of the fruit of knowledge which dispels ignorance, that man becomes like one of the Elohim or the Dianas, and once in their plane the spirit of solidarity and perfect harmony which reigns in every hierarchy must extend over him and protect him in every particular. The chief difficulty which prevents men of science from believing in divine as well as in nature spirits is their materialism. The main impediment before the spiritualist which hinders him from believing in the same while preserving a blind belief in the quote spirits unquote of the departed is the general ignorance of all except some occultists and cabalists about the true essence and nature of matter. It is on the right comprehension of the primeval evolution of spirit matter and its real essence that the student has to depend for the further elucidation in his mind of the occult cosmogony and for the only sure clue which can guide his subsequent studies. In sober truth, as just shown, every spirit, so-called, is either a disembodied or a future man, as from the highest archangel, Dion Kokan, down to the last conscious builder, the inferior class of spiritual entities. All such are men, having lived aeons ago in other manatara, on this or other spheres. So the inferior, semi-intelligent and non-intelligent elementals are all future men. That fact alone, that a spirit is endowed with intelligence, is a proof to the occultist that that being must have been a man and acquired his knowledge and intelligence throughout the human cycle. There is but one indivisible and absolute omniscience and intelligence in the universe, and this thrills throughout every atom and infinitesimal point of the whole finite cosmos, which hath no bounds, and which people call space, considered independently of anything contained in it.
but the first differentiation of its reflection in the manifested world is purely spiritual, and the beings generated in it are not endowed with a consciousness that has any relation to the one we conceive of. They can have no human consciousness or intelligence before they have acquired such personally and individually. This may be a mystery, yet it is a fact in esoteric philosophy, and a very apparent one, too. The whole order of nature evinces a progressive march towards a higher life. There is design in the action of the seemingly blindest forces. The whole process of evolution with its endless adaptation is a proof of this. The immutable laws that weed out the weak and feeble species to make room for the strong, and which ensure the quote, survival of the fittest, unquote, though so cruel in their immediate action, are all working towards the grand end. The very fact that adaptations do occur, that the fittest do survive in the struggle for existence, shows that what is called unconscious nature is in reality an aggregate of forces manipulated by semi-intelligent beings, elementals, guided by high planetary spirits, the uncoffins, whose collective aggregate forms the manifested data boom of the unmanifested logos and constitutes at one and the same time the mind of the universe and its immutable law. Note, nature taken in its abstract sense cannot be unconscious, as it is the emanation from a thousand aspects on the manifested plane of the absolute consciousness. Where is that daring man who would presume to deny to vegetation and even to minerals a consciousness of their own? All he can say is that this consciousness is beyond his comprehension. Three distinct representations of the universe in its three distinct aspects are impressed upon our thought by the esoteric philosophy. Three existing, ever existing phenomena. The pre existing evolved from the ever existing and the phenomenal, the world of illusion, the reflection and shadow thereof. During the great mystery and drama of life known as the Manantara, Real cosmos is like the object placed behind the white screen on which are thrown the Chinese shadows called forth by the magic lanterns. The actual figures and things remain invisible while the wires of evolution are pulled by the unseen hands, and men and things are thus but the reflections on the white field of the realities behind the snares of the Mahamaya, or the great illusion. This was taught in every philosophy, in every religion, ante as well as post-diluvian, in India and Chaldea, by the Chinese as by the Grecian sages. In the former countries, these three universes were allegorized in exoteric teachings by the three trinities emanating from the central eternal germ and forming with it a supreme unity, the initial, the manifested, and the creative triad. Or three in one. But the symbol, in its concrete expression, of the first ideal, too. Hence, esoteric philosophy passes over the necessarianism of this purely metaphysical conception and calls the first one only the ever existing. This is the view of every one of the six great schools of Indian philosophy, the six principles of that unit body of wisdom of which the gnosis, the hidden knowledge, is in the seventh. Note that, superficially handled as may be the comments on the seven stanzas, enough has been given in the cosmogony portion of the work to show archaic teachings to be more scientific in the modern sense of the word, on their very face, the ancient scriptures left to be regarded and judged on their exoteric aspect. Since, however, as confessed before, this work withholds far more than it gives out the student is invited to use his own intuition. Our chief care is to elucidate that which has already been given out, and to our regret, very incorrectly at times, to supplement the knowledge hinted at, whenever and wherever possible, by additional matter, and to bulwark our doctrines against the too strong attacks of modern sectarianism.
and more especially against those of our latter-day materialism, very often miscalled science, whereas in reality the words scientists and scientists ought alone to bear the responsibility for many illogical theories offered to the world. In its great ignorance, the public, while blindly accepting everything that emanates from, quote, authorities, unquote, and feeling it to be its duty to regard every dictum coming from a man of science as a proven fact, the public, we say, is taught to scoff at anything brought forward from, quote, heathen, unquote, sources. Therefore, as materialistic scientists can be fought solely with their own weapons, those of controversy and argument, an addendum is added to every book contrasting our respective views and showing how even great authorities may often err. We believe that this can be done effectually by showing the weak points of our opponents and by proving their too frequent sophisms made to pass for scientific dicta to be incorrect. We hold to Hermes and his wisdom in its universal character. They, to Aristotle's against intuition and the experience of the ages, fancying that truth is the exclusive property of the Western world, hence the disagreement. As Hermes says, knowledge differs much from sense, for sense is a thing that surmount it. But knowledge, greed, is the end of sense, that is, of the illusion of our physical brain and its intellect thus emphasizing the contrast between the laboriously acquired knowledge of the senses and mind, manas, and the intuitive omniscience of the spiritual divine soul, buddhi. Whatever may be the destiny of these actual writings in the remote future, we hope to have proven so far the following facts. 1. The secret doctrine teaches no atheism, except in the Hindu sense of the word nashtika or the rejection of idols, including every anthropomorphic god. In this sense, every occultist is a Gnostica. Two, it admits a logos, or a collective, quote, creator, unquote, of the universe. A demiurgus, in the sense implied when one speaks of an architect as the creator of an edifice, whereas that architect has never touched one stone on it, but while furnishing the plan, left all the manual labor to the mansions. In our case, the plan was furnished by the ideation of the universe, and the constructive labor was left to the hosts of intelligent powers and forces. But that Demiurgos is no personal deity, that is, an imperfect extra-cosmic god, but only the aggregate of the Ancotians and the other forces. As to the latter, three, they are dual in their character, being composed of A, the irrational brute energy inherent in matter, and B, the intelligent soul or cosmic consciousness which directs and guides that energy, and which is the Daikokani called reflecting the radiation of the universal mind. This results in a perpetual series of physical manifestations and moral effects on Earth during momentary periods the whole being subservient to karma. As that process is not always perfect, and since however many proofs it may exhibit of a guiding intelligence behind the veil, it still shows gaps and flaws, and even results very often in evident failures. Therefore, neither the collective host, Demiurgus, nor any of the working powers individually are proper subjects for divine honors or worship. Entitled to the grateful reverence of humanity, however, and man ought to be ever striving to help the divine evolution of ideas by becoming, to the best of his ability, a co-worker with nature in the cyclic task. The ever unknowable and incognizable Karana alone, the causeless cause of all causes, should have its shrine and altar on the holy and ever untrodden ground of our heart, invisible, intangible unmentioned, save through, quote, the still small voice, unquote, of our spiritual consciousness. Those who worship before it ought to do so in the silence and the sanctified solitude of their souls, making their spirit the sole mediator between them and the universal spirit, their good actions the only priests, 
and their sinful intentions the only visible and objective sacrificial victims to the presence. See part two on the hidden deity. Note, quote, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, but enter into thine inner chamber, and having shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. From Matthew chapter 6. Our father is within us, in secret, our seventh principle in the inner chamber of our soul perception. The kingdom of heaven and of God is within us, says Jesus, not outside. Why are Christians so absolutely blind to the self-evident meaning of the words of wisdom they delight in mechanically repeating? In a minute. Matter is eternal. It is the upadi, the physical basis, for the one infinite universal mind to build their own its ideations. Therefore, the esotericists maintain that there is no inorganic or dead matter in nature. The distinction between the two made by science being as unfounded as it is arbitrary and devoid of reason. Whatever science may think, however, and exact science is a fickle dame, as we all know by experience. Occultism knows and teaches differently from time immemorial, from Manu and Hermes, down to Paracelsus and his successors. Thus Hermes, the thrice great Trismegistus, says, O my son, matter becomes, formerly it was, for matter is the vehicle of becoming. Note, to this the late Mrs. Dr. Kinsford the able translator and compiler of the Hermetic Fragments, see the Virgin of the World, remarks in a footnote. Dr. Menard observes that in Greek the same word signifies to be born and to become. The idea here is that the material of the world is in its essence eternal, but that before creation or becoming it is in a passive and motionless condition. Thus it was before being put into operation. Now it becomes, that is, it is mobile and progressive, and she adds the purely Vedantic doctrine of the Hermetic philosophy that creation is thus the period of activity, Manvantara, of God who, according to Hermetic thought, for which, according to the Vedanta, has two modes, activity or existence, God evolved, Deus ex icticus, and passivity of being, Pranaya. God involved, Deus implicticus. Both modes are perfect and complete, as are the waking and sleeping states of man. Fichte, a German philosopher, distinguished being, saying, as one, which we know only through existence, thus saying. This view is thoroughly hermetic. The ideal form are the archetypal or formative ideas of the Neoplatonists, the eternal and subjective concepts of things subsisting in the divine mind prior to becoming. Unquote, page 134, end of note. Becoming is the mode of activity of the uncreated deity. Having been endowed with the germs of becoming, matter, objective, is brought into birth for the creative force passions it according to the idea of forms. Matter not engendered had no form. It becomes when it is put into operation, says Hermes, the definitions of the Asclepius, page 134, Virgin of the World. The universe was evolved out of its ideal plan. 